kind of careful tonight because we're taping this for Georgia Public Broadcasting, so um, think about that when we ask your questions. <laughs> It'll be on the statewide uh, website. Anyway, uh, good evening. I'm David Bull. I'm the chair of the Department of Communication here at Augusta University, and I want to welcome you to the Future of the First Amendment Lecture 2023. We started this in 2019, and the pandemic came along, so we haven't had one in person since then. Uh, we are being sponsored tonight by the AU Libraries uh, and Pamplin College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Also want to say that David Kearns of the library here, uh, the Reese Library, has got books about the First Amendment that he will be happy to check out to you. You can go browse them uh, after we finish, and if you have an AU ID, you can check them out. Well, we're here tonight to pay homage to, and I hope to protect and promote, a secularly sacred part of our culture, that is the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America. 
the 45 words of the First Amendment, which I hope you got a copy of as you came in with tonight's program, was ratified into law on December 15, 1791, and provides the underpinning of our democracy in that this amendment guarantees freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, and the right to criticize the powers that be. By the way, I can remember the date because December 15th is my wedding anniversary. <laughs> Before I introduce this year's Future of the First Amendment lecturer, Frank Lamonte from Atlanta, I'd like to invite Professor Emeritus Hubert Van Toole, who taught history for more than three decades, to the stage to honor America and its constitution. I'm going to ask everybody to stand, too, with a rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. Thank you, Hubert, for coming tonight. Thank you, David. And before you ask why I'm holding a piece of paper here, I've reached, I'm afraid I've reached the age where I don't trust anything to a memory. And if you don't know what I, what I mean, you will. If you please join me. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we washed were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the I'm a Baltimore Orioles fan, and uh, as you get to the end of that, you're supposed to say, oh! But anyway, great job. Thank you, Hubert. Also, Hubert is an attorney in addition to being a professor, so appropriate to have him sing the Star Spangled Banner. Well, tonight we'll be acting out in real time at least three of the rights guaranteed in the First Amendment, assembly, speech, and press. The news media is here. We have the Augusta Press. We have the Bell Ringer. We have Jack Wire. Uh, and it's also, of course, being recorded for GPB. Um, and I suspect there will also be some criticism as well. But without further ado, tonight our special guest is Frank Lamonte, an attorney based in Atlanta who does legal work for CNN. Uh, it is fair to say that Frank is a Georgia guy, all right? And by that, I mean he had his JD from the University of Georgia Law School. So even though he worked at the University of Florida later on, he's a bulldog. And his undergraduate degree is from Georgia State University, so he's a Georgian all the way. For a while, he was even a journalist connected to Augusta. He worked for Morris Media, which of course owned the Augusta Chronicle forever. Uh, and at that time, he actually covered uh, Atlanta, the State House, and the Southeast in general for Morris Media, which was a major league uh, media company in its heyday. So for those of us who have a connection to the scholastic and college uh, journalism, Franks is a household name. For he was, for 11 years, the executive director of the Student Press Law Center in Washington, uh, another big city that, that he loved living in. And before coming to CNN for several years, he was the director of the Breckman Center for Freedom of Information at the University of Florida, which is my alma mater, where I got my PhD. The title of his talk tonight is Free Speech and Transparency on Campus Lessons from the Pandemic. I'm not going to talk anymore. It's Frank's turn. Welcome, Frank Lamonte, to Augusta University in our fair city, Augusta, Georgia. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, if, uh, you don't like anything you hear, you can just have fourth First Amendment right and petition the government afterward. So I am. Uh, Thank you, Dave, for making all these wonderful arrangements and for 
convening this gathering, and uh, thank you to Dean Warren and, and Davies for uh, supporting this event, and uh, thanks to everybody here at uh, Augusta for coming out. I, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that we're not competing up against basketball tonight. I had no uh, no no role in that. <laughs> I um, I'm having a little bit of a fangirl moment here because uh, two of my legal idols, uh, Jim Ellington and David Hudson, are in the audience. And uh, as Dave said, I was a journalist for a long time before I became a lawyer. And one reason that I was inspired to become a lawyer was looking at the work of people like Jim and Dave representing news organizations and showing what was possible using the, the power of the law for good. Um, that was one of my inspirations. And my other inspiration was all the politicians in the General Assembly that I've covered where I said, well, if that idiot can pass the bar exam, I know I can. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you again for convening this gathering. And I want to especially thank you for your optimism in calling this the future of the First Amendment. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hear that we all agree that it has a future because uh, uh, that's not necessarily a, uh, an uncontroversial proposition in today's culture. So um, I just want to share with you some thoughts and some experiences from the, some of the legal work that, that I've done, some of the research particularly that I've done using my uh, University of Florida professor hat, um, and then hopefully leave some time at the end for some q and I really uh, hope you all will use that uh, freedom of expression and uh, jump in with some challenging uh, questions. And I will start, as I always must, with the disclaimer that although Dave's correct that I uh, do legal work now for CNN, I am not here on behalf of my employer, and I do not speak on behalf of them. Uh, and so this is my own individual uh, opinion for whatever that is worth. Um, so um, Dave Fuller and I actually go back a really long time, and uh, I had to dig around for this uh, to find uh, uh, circa about 2011, I believe. Uh, and uh, this was the, uh, the lovely campus of Iowa State University where we both were at that time. And I had the honor of being keynote speaker for First Amendment Day at uh, Iowa State. And what you can see in this picture is I'm holding up a sign about the uh, Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer case, which is the case that deprived journalism students at uh, high school and occasionally at colleges of the protection of the First Amendment um, when they work for uh, school uh, funded curricular publications. And, we were on a campaign that I'm, I'm pleased to say just resulted in the other day passing a, a, a new law in the state of West Virginia, of all places, an unlikely place. So uh, not going to say Georgia is behind West Virginia. Even you guys need to get on the stick here. I, 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 I'll, I'll shame you by comparison. But uh, uh, there are now uh, 16 and counting of these state laws that protect uh, the rights of student journalists, uh, 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 give them a heightened degree of protection, restoring what the Supreme Court took away in this uh, case of Case. What you don't see is that as soon as this picture was taken, I threw the sign down and put my winter coat, my earbuds back on, because that place is the coldest place on earth. And I've been to Alaska a couple times and to Canada a bunch of times. I have never been colder than Iowa cold. It is the cold that goes right in your bones and tells you if you do not go inside, you will die. And I remember experiencing that as a reporter, as Dave said, I used to for Billy Morris's newspaper chain, and I had the pleasure of uh, covering a couple of presidential campaigns uh, uh, on the, Mr. Morris's then Ansel Nichols, and um, one uh, one year I got the pleasure of going up and covering the Iowa caucuses, right, which is the big weed out for uh, presidential candidates. And a guy named Bruce Babbitt, who had been the um, governor of Arizona, was one of the Democratic candidates. Seemed like he had some promise, and he made the rash decision that he was going to attract publicity by riding his bicycle in, in, in his uh, tights um, all the way across the state of the width of the state of, of Iowa. That was, his, uh, that was his gimmick. And a bunch of us showed up for the first morning of that and never came back because it was outdoors. <laughs> and we all agreed among the press corps that we were only going to cover candidates from there on who campaigned inside of shopping malls. And so if he had just, uh, just, just ridden a bike in, uh, in, in fitness centers across Iowa, he might have been president. Um, but yeah, that's a good memory uh, uh, of uh, uh, another um, university that's uh, invested in celebrating um, the First Amendment. Um, the, um, 
the theme of the talk tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, free speech and openness and transparency in government at colleges and universities. And this is a very auspicious, and I think coincidental time, uh, this happened to be Sunshine Week, which was uh, proclaimed in uh, 2005 by the uh, ASNE, the American Society of uh, Newspaper Editors, um, as a celebration of the value and the importance of an open and transparent government in our society. And these two things kind of marry up, uh, freedom of speech and freedom of access to information in ways that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, unfortunately, when you have a conversation these days about First Amendment on college campuses, this is typically what you're talking about. You're talking about, um, it's a little bit of a damaged brand, to be honest with you, right? When I mean, you're talking about the First Amendment, it's rarely the happiest occasion of your life. You're typically talking about it because somebody has started trouble, right? At my old university, this was about three weeks after I got to my job at the university. Uh, we were descended upon by this carnival of uh, uh, neo-Nazis uh, uh, who uh, insisted on using their First Amendment right to uh, use a, uh, a, a meeting hall on the uh, campus of uh, University of Florida State University um, with, as you see, rancorous results. Um, and this is, you know, when many people hear First Amendment on college campuses today, this is sort of what they hear, right? Well, the First Amendment, that's the thing that Nazis hide behind. That's the thing that racists hide behind. That's the things that anti-Semites hide behind. And you know what? There's something to that. But hopefully by the time we finish uh, uh, our hour tonight, you'll see the First Amendment as, you know, for every neo-Nazi and every racist that is ever hidden behind the First Amendment, there's a civil rights activist that's darn glad that it exists. Um, there's a terrific book. Um, I'm not able to assign reading anymore now I'm not a professor, but um, if I were able to assign reading, um, I would uh, encourage everybody to read. It's by uh, Gene Roberts and Hank Kudenoff. It's called The Race Beat, B-E-A-T. And it's all about the press corps in the South that covered the civil rights movement. And not to ruin the book for you, but I'm going to give you the last line because it's the best part of the whole book. John Lewis, the Atlanta congressman, um, tells Roberts and Klibanoff that the civil rights movement without the press would have been like a bird without a song. A bird without a song. And it's a beautiful way to end the book. And it's sort of a, a, a tribute to the fact that freedom of speech and the protection of the First Amendment, both for the protesters and for the people covering them, were essential to getting that word out and changing minds and reaching audiences outside of the South. Um, so the First Amendment, um, I kind of think of a little bit like um, when the First Amendment shows up in conversation, it's sort of like FEMA showing up. Um, um, on the one hand, you're really happy to see them, and I'm really happy when the First Amendment is there, but on the other hand, you're almost always in a disaster when it shows up. Uh, you're almost always waist deep in mud, right? And so while it's terrific that we have the protection of freedom of speech, freedom of speech doesn't matter when you're saying something that's non-controversial, right? Nobody's trying to silence you for saying happy Mother's Day or have a nice day, right? Or singing the Star Spangled Banner. They're trying to silence you when you're out there on the fringes and out there on the edges and saying something that, that pushes boundaries and pushes people's buttons, right? And so typically you're at least knee deep, if not waist deep in, uh, in mud uh, when the First Amendment shows up to come to your rescue. Um, but again, we're, uh, we're, we're darn lucky that we have it. Um, this is one week's worth of headlines. I just called, um, I tried to call. Um, it is not possible to watch TV news or create a news website these days without coming across a free speech issue. And you know, there are free speech issues and there are First Amendment issues, right? And we talk about the difference between those, right? But not every speech, free speech issue is a First Amendment issue. Um, um, we'll talk about the difference between those. But as you see, right, Florida is debating some legislation right now that would roll back legal protections for all the speakers um, that protect their ability to uh, comment, particularly on public figures and matters of public concern without fear of being uh, hit with a libel suit. Um, several states are passing uh, bills that would uh, uh, make it a crime to expose young people to drag performances that uh, many people in that community feel is inhibiting their ability to express themselves. And the uh, Supreme Court has told us, right, that dancing is protected First Amendment activity. Uh, it's expressive in nature, right? Uh, we all know about the uh, Dominion lawsuit against uh, uh, Fox uh, uh, Broadcasting asking for an excess of uh, 1.6 billion with B dollars uh, over uh, their uh, coverage of uh, election uh, fraud allegations that implicated Dominion and their voting machines. Uh, uh, 
Kentucky is among the states, uh, Florida included, that is uh, debating what kinds of books should be on the shelves in school libraries and even sometimes municipal libraries for young people to read. And the Supreme Court just heard a pair of companion cases uh, about holding social media companies responsible for the speech that their users post. And there's two more on the horizon uh, that are called the net choice cases. We can talk about that a little later as well if anybody's interested in going that way, where the court may for the first time kind of pierce the, uh, uh, the immunity that thus far has protected the ability of social media companies and other online platforms not to be held legally liable for what their users post. So as you can see, when you're in the First Amendment business, you will never be out of work, right? This is a very, very busy and very agenda of stuff, all of which in one way or another implicates our friend the First Amendment. Um, uh, this picture makes me sad. This is a, one I took up in, the, in Washington, D.C. before the museum stopped being the museum. I don't know how many people had the opportunity to visit it. It was a, a, a museum of news, uh, and it's no longer a museum of news. Like many things in the news business, it ran out of money. Um, but uh, at the time, uh, when you went up Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, somewhere uh, uh, right between the uh, U.S. Capitol building and the White House, you would go past this edifice that displayed about a four-story uh, tall replica of the, uh, the First Amendment. Um, and uh, uh, the, um, uh, the First Amendment, right, uh, as you see, it starts out, Congress shall make no law, blah, 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 abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. And I don't want to turn this into Law School 101, nobody wants that, but um, in fact, I understand most of you are, or many of you are public speaking students, right? Uh, uh, take good notes and watch carefully, and by the end of these 40 minutes, you'll know everything not to do. Um, but uh, uh, for, uh, for those who uh, download sort of the first year of constitutional law, it's about two minutes of it, right? The First Amendment, the protection of freedom of speech in the press, is really, really, really powerful when it comes to information that you already have in your hands. Once you have your hands on information as a speaker or a publisher, there is nothing the government can do. And that's been tested over and over and over again, even under very extreme circumstances. A uh, leaker shows up with stolen Pentagon documents. Can you publish them? Yes, says the Supreme Court. You didn't steal them, that's not on you. Leaker shows up with a tape-recorded conversation that he illegally recorded with two people who were having a newsworthy conversation. Can you, the journalist, publish it? Yes, the Supreme Court tells us. You didn't break the law. So even under very extreme circumstances, the court has protected the right to publish newsworthy information, frankly, even if it was obtained in ways that we all disapprove of. Um, and the uh, the, the doctrine that the court coined for that, this goes back over a century, a case called Near versus Minnesota, is the doctrine called prior restraint, right? This is how judges talk about this, that there is no stopping the presses. There is no flipping off the internet. There is no switching off or unplugging the TV station. Once the information is in the hands of the journalist or any speaker, the government just can't stop it, and that includes the courts. But notice what the First Amendment does not say does not say is that there is an affirmative duty or an obligation on the government to give you information, right? It just says they can't stop you from speaking, they can't stop you from publishing, they can't stop you from broadcasting, but there is no constitutional duty for the government to be open or transparent with us, and for that we have to look to statutes, right? Either the Freedom of Information Act passed by Congress or the analogy to it at the state level or the Open Meetings Act in the state level. And of course, those are great, right? But they're also vulnerable to being hampered with by legislators. You know, legislators give it, but they can take it away. Um, and, and they do. Uh, uh, in Florida, where, uh, where I used to work, um, it's renowned, renowned as being the capital of openness in government absolutely renowned. It's the most transparent state, the sunshine state, right? There's how many categories of records do you think have been exempted by the state legislature so that they do not have to be shared with the public? Lobbyists. Heard somebody say 100? 50, 30. 50, 30. <laughs> <laughs> 
1,100. 1,100 categories of documents that state legislators have decided that you and I don't get to see even though we paid for them. Um, and so um, this is the reality of the law of access. The court has been asked over and over and over again um, to recognize, to create some constitutional right to see what the government is up to. And they have so far refused to do it. Um, cases like the, the, the Pell case where the Supreme Court said that there's no right to insist on going inside of a prison even though you suspect that there's wrongdoing in there. And you've got your TV camera outside. You have a constitutional right to insist on going inside to gather that news about the potential scandal. No, says the court. You know, this is not a space that's open to the general public. And so even though press is listed right there in the First Amendment, there's no superior right to demand to walk around inside and gather news. And that applies to sort of any place that news is happening. Um, the one encouraging development, and, and as Dave told you, I worked for a decade in the uh, student rights field. I mean, you cannot work in the field of student rights and not be an optimist. And so I am an optimist. Um, and as an optimist, I will say that the one area where the law is moving in a very positive pro-access direction toward more rights is the ability to keep tabs on police and law enforcement. And judges all around the country have recognized that there is a right to, although it's not a right to show prisoners up at the jail, right, or to demand access to particular um, um, news events, that there is a right to record what the police are doing in public places. That includes here in Georgia, and most recently, actually, a court up in Virginia decided that that even extends to um, using your smartphone to live stream your own traffic stop. That that, too, says the court is protected by the First Amendment. And so um, while there may not be a generalized right to show up at a government agency and demand that they turn over all their information or demand that they throw their premises and their doors open, um, that is an interesting little crack in the door, and, and smart, creative lawyers like Mr. Ellington and Mr. Hudson always figure out a way to turn that crack into a slightly bigger crack and a slightly bigger crack until you can walk through it, and I look forward to what they do with that one. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the First Amendment right talks about Congress shall make no law, and I think when, when most of us think about the government, capital P, capital G, this is what we think of, right? We think of guys with dark sunglasses and $8 super cut haircuts uh, uh, who, are, uh, who raid your house, right? This is what we think of when we think of the government. But over the years, the courts have told us that Congress shall make no law really means any level of government shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, and that includes the states, cities, counties, all the way down to the littlest government agency, little school district, little sheriff's department, right? They're all bound by the First Amendment because of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, right, incorporates the Bill of Rights against state and local governments, part of the Civil Rights Amendments, so that um, um, the, the post-Civil Rights, uh, post-Civil War Amendments, so that um, every level of government today is constrained in its ability to restrict your freedom of speech. So, this includes, importantly, right here, right? State colleges and state universities are regarded as what are called state actors for purposes of the First Amendment, which means they are constrained in their ability to tell people what they can and cannot say. And I'm sorry that I have to tell you this, but I have to keep telling you this because university administrators don't always get that message yet. It is not always uh, uh, universally accepted and agreed upon that uh, colleges or schools are bound by the same First Amendment standards as, as Congress, and we'll talk a little bit about how that law has uh, evolved. Um, but the Supreme Court, in its most kind of explicit take on this back in the 1970s, which was kind of like, think about, you know, 1970s that you can conjure up, right, from Woodstock and Vietnam and unrest on Kent, Kent State, unrest on college campuses, and people protesting, and uh, uh, the uh, Haley versus James case, this was an anti-war, kind of a radical anti-war organization that was asking to be officially recognized as a student organization. And the university said, no, we're not going to give you recognition. You guys support violence, and we can't have that. And the Supreme Court says, you can't pick and choose based on the viewpoint of the organization to decide which one gets recognition and which one does not, and certainly not in a political 
viewpoint, which is the most highly protected speech there is, says the court. And they tell us explicitly, I don't want to read the whole thing to you, but basically what they say, right, is that there is no room for argument that the First Amendment somehow applies with less force on a college campus than it would in the rest of the world. And so while the court has not really directly kind of created a blanket rule protecting the First Amendment rights of college students. This is pretty darn close. This is pretty darn close. And over the years, um, the Supreme Court speakers are actually, fun fact, uh, college students are 4-0 um, in First Amendment cases against their institutions. Uh, uh, college students have never lost a uh, free speech case in front of the uh, US Supreme Court, although they've lost a ton in the lower courts. And uh, I'll give you some examples of that in a minute that uh, for, again, for somebody like me in the student rights business, kind of keep you up at night. Um, but um, so you would think, right, <laughs> you would think that um, higher education being this kind of beacon of academic freedom, right, being the standard bearer for uh, uh, kind of setting the, the aspirational standards for the exchange of information and ideas, right, you would sort of think that higher education was going to be the most open and transparent of all government agencies. But after a decade of doing that work, I'm here to tell you, not necessarily so. In fact, in several respects, colleges and universities, like all government agencies, um, overreach in restricting people's ability to speech and to, to speak and in keeping secret things that the public has a right to know. And, and I, I, I use this one to start with for a, a, a reason. Um, so when I, um, when I came down to Florida in 2017 to take my job as a university research. I was running sort of a think tank about openness in government. And it was the first time I ever really had like the luxury of being able to do research and actually like work on the same thing for six or eight weeks without a crisis. And um, I asked my friends in the um, news media and lawyers that represent news media, what, what are your pain points? I would say like, what if I could wave the wand and, and fix something? And uh, understand that pain point number one is money, and nobody has enough of it. That I can't do. I have magic, but I'm not that good. Um, if I could wave the legal wand and, and change something in the law that would make your life better and make your, uh, your job easier, what would it be? And honest to gosh, every single person told me, here's my biggest problem. My biggest problem is nobody will talk to me anymore. Everybody is afraid. The CDC, the State Department, the state of Georgia, the state of Florida, the highway patrol, the sheriff's department, the school district, they're all terrified that if they give an interview, they're gonna get fired, they're gonna be retaliated against because their agency is so image conscious and so protective of its reputation that if you don't go and get permission from all the right people before you say anything, you'll be at risk, you're putting your, you're putting your job on the line and nobody wants to do that. And so we started a project in Florida called Government Gag, and uh, uh, it's all about trying to shine a, a, a light on these gag orders that restrict people from, from speaking. And I will, will tell you that as a lawyer, right, sometimes, and Jim and David can vouch for this, sometimes you, you, you have an issue come in the door and you think to yourself, you know, this is a real long shot here. I, I don't know if there's going to be a Lawyer, lawyer, sort of the, the your mother's milk is, a, is is court cases, right? I spend a lot of time reading court cases. Is there a court case that somehow addresses itself to this problem that my client has brought in the door? Is there a court case that I can point them to that would give them some hope somehow that that they have a, a right here that maybe they didn't know they had? And um, I started digging. Um, uh, Linda Norbert was my um, my legal assistant at the time. She's now a media lawyer in her own right. She's great. Um, and Linda and I started digging. And after a couple of days of digging, we said, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Are you finding what I'm finding? And what we were finding was that every time a government employee challenged one of these orders by their employer that said, don't speak to the press, the employee won and the agency lost. Not once, not twice, 27 times as far as we could tell. The speaker is 27 and oh, right? Sound pretty good for your basketball team now, right? I'm <laughs> 27 and 0. And so nobody's 27 and 0. I mean, that's an amazing string of, of First Amendment victories. And it's all over the country. It's all over the country. Even the Mississippi courts have said this. Um, and so this was an eye opener to us. Like, how is it possible that the entire field of government is unaware that these court rulings exist, telling them 
that you can't do what you've been doing. And I think the answer is that it is so important to government agencies to protect their image and protect their reputation. They're kind of willing to take the hit. They're kind of willing to say, you know what? Sue me. A, I don't think you will. And B, even if you do, guess who's paying for the lawyers? Not the person who's enforcing the gag. We are, right? Those are publicly funded lawyers. And so um, there's kind of no downside, right? If you're a government agency and you put one of those orders in place that says nobody here talks to the press, nobody here is allowed to speak to the news media, if you can't just speak to the news media, you're going to be fired, right? Worst thing that happens to them is that they get sued. We all pay for the lawyers. <laughs> we all pay, write a nice check, maybe to Mr. Allen's firm, Mr. Hudson's firm at the end uh, uh, when they win. Um, but that's it. That's that's all that happens. And so uh, 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 these orders, our research found, are everywhere from the highest level of government all the way on down, and it includes colleges and universities. That employees are being told you cannot speak to the press without permission, and if we catch you doing it, you're going to be disciplined. Interestingly enough, right? Once you that was kind of a kind of a sugar high there. When you find those 27 cases, you're like, this is pretty cool. I wonder what do with this, right? Talk about cracking that door open, you know, maybe kick it open a little wider, right? So we started looking around a little further. Well, other than these employee rule books, these employee handbooks, I wonder how widespread this policy is, this practice is. And one of the things we found, it's in athletic departments everywhere. College athletes everywhere all over the country are being told they're not allowed to speak without permission, and if they get caught speaking without permission, they'll be disciplined. And um, so in the land of the First Amendment, this is as much law school as I'll down on you tonight. In the land of the First Amendment, there are two things that really matter. Thing number one is, what is the government's justification for its restriction, right? If the government has a compelling enough justification, lives will be lost, people will die. If they have a compelling enough justification to do anything, Anything. They lock you up, right? It's a compelling enough justification. And the second is, is what the government is doing tailored, and that's the word that courts always use, is tailored to the wrong, the problem that they're trying to address, right? And did they go after the fly with a fly swatter, or did they go after the fly with a sledgehammer? If they went after the fly with a sledgehammer, they're going to lose. That's not a tailored rule, right? And these rules, which are everywhere, I just, I just pulled three of my favorite sound bites out of handbooks for college athletes around the country. All these are at state universities, right? At state universities, we know, we talk about the First Amendment applies, right? They're governed by the First Amendment. They're, they're, they're restricted in what they can and can't tell people to say. Um, many of these are not only restrictions on speaking, but they also go further and say, and if you do speak, if we do give you permission to speak, make sure you don't ever criticize the university or anybody in it, just say positive things. And, you know, one of the things that we kind of hold pretty dear in this society is, is whistleblowing, right? I mean, there's awards for whistleblowing. There, there's, there's, you know, people, people are held up on a pedestal for being courageous enough to blow the whistle, and these are anti-whistleblowing. Right? These are rules that explicitly forbid whistleblowing inside of a field, college sports, where let's just be honest about it, there's a fair amount of abuse that goes on. There's a fair amount of physical safety risks to the people participating, and we're really just now kind of coming to appreciate how much exploitation of these young people is happening inside the silence of the locker room, the government-enforced silence of the locker room. And so Getting back to my two First Amendment fundamentals, right? Is this a tailored policy? Is this a policy that is tailored to address itself to a uh, to a, a wrong? Well, we look at the rule books, and it doesn't say anything about don't talk during the season. It doesn't say don't talk during the time when you're busy preparing for games. It just says don't talk. And so, if you're in a sport that has a six month season, you're gag 12 months. You can't talk even when you're not busy preparing, even when it would not distract you from the games or distract you from your prep, you're gag all year round. So it doesn't seem very tailored at all, does it? Nor does it address itself to a compelling life and death interest. And in fact, if you ask these athletic departments why they have these rules, they'll generally tell you two things. They'll tell you, first of all, well, we, we have to protect the image and the reputation of the 
the university and its programs. They have an interest in making sure that people maintain a, a positive and favorable image. And the other is to protect these young people from themselves. Uh, 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 that's an answer you'll often get. They're, you know, they're young, and they're, they're, you know, ABC and ESPN are going to stick microphones in their face, and they might say something stupid that they'll regret. So to protect them from themselves, um, we, we silence them from speaking. And, and I will tell you, I mean, I'm not the best First Amendment lawyer in the world, but I can tell you that in, in First Amendment law, if you justify your rule by saying, well, we're here to protect the government against criticism and to protect you from saying something stupid, those are the two worst possible justifications in First Amendment law that you could possibly imagine. I mean, you're, you're litigating a First Amendment case against the government. You want them to walk in and say that. You would pay good cash money for them to walk in and say that. And the reason we have this rule is so people don't say stupid things that hurt themselves, or to God forbid that they hurt our reputation. I mean, if you don't remember anything about, else about the First Amendment, remember this. It's there to hurt the government's reputation. That's not a bug, it's a feature. That's why we put it there. That's why we threw the T in the heart, so that we could harm the government's reputation. I, if the government starts saying that we silence people from speaking to protect our reputation, we've just flipped it on its head, right? And while these happen to be in college athlete handbooks, you can find comparable language in um, police rule books, lots of those in police rule books, and in, I don't know if anybody here is a, an RA, in a campus dorm or campus housing, in the RA handbooks. They're all in the RA. Don't, don't let us catch you saying anything uh, unfavorable about the university or else you lose your job, you get kicked out of your apartment. Um, and, and it's just wrong, right? And it's not only illegal, I mean, we know it's illegal, but it's also wrong, right? Like, why, why would you want to assert that level of control over people when, you know, if you ask universities kind of in the vacuum and abstract, hey, what do you, what do you, what's your goal here? What, do you, what does a higher education exist to do? One of the things that they'll tell you pretty, pretty straight out is we're here to produce engaged, participatory citizens. We're here to teach good citizenship, to get people engaged in their community and their country, right? Except just don't do it here. <laughs> Just don't do it here, go do it somewhere else. Go engage civically somewhere else. This is a little too close for comfort if you start engaging in our backyard. Um, and so these, these policies are, are uh, uh, not, not that I'm speaking to my audience of First Amendment litigators here, but uh, by golly, somebody uh, ought, to be, uh, ought to be challenging these. Um, so I mentioned there are a couple ways that universities are kind of going backwards on the First Amendment, and that was one of them, was gagging their employees and their athletes and their police officers Campus RAs are speaking. This is the other way. Universities are, are going backwards. Um, social media. Um, lots of government agencies, higher ed included, had sort of a collective freak out moment when people started to use social media because, right, the, the viral video, the viral moment, that's, that's what government agencies are most terrified of, right? I mean, it's one thing to write a letter in the editor, you have a letter in the bell ringer that reached a couple hundred people, and maybe last a day or two, and then people throw the newspaper away, put them in the kitty litter box, whatever they do with it, right? I mean, that's okay, I can take that hit. You know, I can, I can take a day's worth of bad press, I can take two days worth of bad press, but they're terrified about the, the reach and the permanence of online speech, right? In particular, social media, the idea that a young person might catch fire and have a megaphone to, reach an unlimited worldwide audience with something that harms the institution's reputation. And for that reason, higher ed institutions, like lots of other places, by the way, I mean, workplaces do this too, have a lot of very restrictive rules about what you can and can't post on social media that carry some pretty stiff punishment if you're caught violating it. Um, this big picture is Amanda Tatro. Amanda was studying to be a funeral director at the University of Minnesota, again, a public university with a First Amendment plan. And uh, Amanda, um, in order to get through, it's a pretty grim program, right? A, a funeral director, uh, you spend a lot of time around cadavers, uh, they spend a lot of time di dissecting dead bodies. And uh, in order to get through the day, um, Amanda developed this kind of, a, kind of a dark, gallow sense of humor. And uh, her mistake was sharing some of that humor on her Facebook page. Um, this came to the attention of the university, which um, was concerned that this was going to cause people to stop wanting to donate grandma's corpse to uh, science because uh, uh, they didn't like the fact that uh, the students might be making fun of uh, the cadavers. Uh, and so they, they disciplined her. And she took this case up to the Minnesota Supreme Court, 
when she decided that, you know, um, Amanda, even though, you know, yes, this is a government agency, and yes, you're a citizen, and we know all about prior restraints, and uh, uh, we don't usually let uh, government agencies punish people for the content of their speech, we're gonna let the university discipline you because you departed from, and this is the phrase they use, you departed from established professional standards. That was the phrase they used here. Your, your speech departed from the established standards of the mortuary science field. And so the sort of terrifying thing about that, right, is that it was on Facebook and our office hour, off hours uh, at home on a personal account. And so that sort of served notice, not just to Amanda, but, but every other college student afterward, that if you say something that wouldn't be appropriate to say inside of a heavily regulated workplace, even on your off hours on social media, that can now be grounds for throwing you out of college, um, which is a pretty, pretty harsh place to draw the, the line. Because think about, right, the professional standards. I've used the example before of, of, of journalism, right? I mean, uh, uh, suppose you, um, you post things on your social media that come from unnamed sources that uh, you haven't thoroughly verified. Are you now subject to being expelled from college because you use social media to post something that wouldn't be consistent with established professional standards of journalism, even though you did it on a Saturday at home? Um, so that's a, 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 a highly, highly aggressive way of, of policing social media speech. Um, and then uh, uh, after Amanda Kajer and guy named Paul Hunt at the uh, University of Mexico, Paul was a zealous, zealous anti-abortion advocate and a medical student. And, and Paul was very outspoken about his uh, opposition to abortion, which he considers murder. He did not hold back on his Facebook page, went on a rant about how people who, uh, uh, who condone abortion are no better than the guards at Nazi death camps. And uh, uh, that, that you're all, Blankety blank. I know we're on public broadcasting, so I won't use the vocabulary. Uh, you're all blankety blank killers, um, and uh, and he was disciplined by the University of New Mexico. And um, even though um, he was expressing a viewpoint on maybe the most contentious political issue in contemporary America, right? It's hard to come up with one that's more of a hot button contemporary issue than that. And even though the courts have always told us that political speech especially gets the highest level of First Amendment protection there is, the university disciplined him for violating their policy against civility, saying, well, you were uncivil on social media. He didn't direct it to anybody. He didn't say, you know, Bob, you're, you're a Nazi. Uh, he didn't say, uh, Bob, you're going to burn a hell. He didn't even identify himself as being with the university or a medical student or anything. Um, um, and uh, they allowed the disciplinary action to stand. No First Amendment for you, Mr. Hunt. Uh, and then this is Nuriana Radawan. This is as close as I'll get to violating the standards of PBS today. Um, Nuriana is making a familiar gesture to all of us. Um, she uh, is, was a college soccer player at the UConn, at Connecticut. And uh, her team scored the winning goal in a big match. So a, a, a huge moment for the uh, UConn Huskies um, team. And uh, ESPN, is that big of a game? ESPN was covering the game. A, a, a camera that was panning the sidelines. And Nuriana sort of leaps to embrace one of her teammates and sees the ESPN camera and for some reason decides that this is going to be her celebratory gesture. Like, basically, F yeah. F yeah <laughs> is, her, is, is her translation of this. Uh, F yeah, we won. Um, and uh, she is um, thrown off the team which results in her no longer being able to afford to attend UConn. So she actually has to leave college and find a less expensive college to go to for this momentary celebration. And she too files a First Amendment lawsuit and says, well, wait a second, you know, it's a momentary thing. I didn't address it to anybody in particular. I wasn't saying F you to somebody in the stands. I was just, you know, having a momentary celebration. And uh, the court says, no First Amendment for you either, Mariana, that uh, we believe that uh, that students at the higher ed level don't have any superior First Amendment rights to students in middle school inside of the school during the school day. And so while since a middle school would have been within its authority to discipline you if you had flipped off somebody in the hallway or the classroom during the school day, so too does the University of Connecticut have the authority to uh, discipline you for doing this on the sidelines of a game during the celebration. I will say that she, uh, uh, she filed a very uh, uh, a, a wide-ranging lawsuit, and one of her other claims, which is that she was singled out uh, for unfair discipline for being a woman, that claim is still alive, so she may live to fight another day on that case, but um, in, in each of these cases, right, the Pedro case, the Hunt case, the Radawan case, 
Um, even though the Supreme Court told us, right, in 1972, told us that the First Amendment does not apply on college campuses with any diminished force, it kind of does. It kind of does um, until the Supreme Court takes up one of these cases, and it's long past overdue for them to do so to uh, address where the First Amendment lines are going to be drawn in higher education uh, for the rights of students. The last thing, and I'm going to wind down here, um, the last thing, because we did talk about the COVID pandemic and transparency, right, and that's where I want to bring us in for a landing. Um, colleges are also going in the wrong direction when it comes to openness and transparency. And remember I said there's no constitutional right to demand access to government records or data, and you have to rely on statutes for that. But the statutes are really pretty strong and they're really pretty clear that if a state agency like a public university has a document or has a database that, that belongs to us and we should get to see it unless an exemption excuses them from complying. But this kind of uh, strained information safety net that we have really strained to the breaking point during the worst of the COVID pandemic. And what we saw there was that, you know, think about it's probably never been a time in anybody's life here where you've been more reliant on or more hungry for accurate data from the government, right? I mean, normally we think of data from the government as, oh, you know, you can exercise your oversight ability as a taxpayer to make sure your tax money isn't being spent wastefully. And that's great. That's good. And I'm glad people do that. But this was life or death, right? This was life or death. Like, you know, is my grandma in a hospital or a nursing home that's safe or unsafe? Or my kids in a school that's safe or unsafe? This was like life and death, um, and no fooling. Um, and, and yet, it was really, really, really hard to get even just very basic data out of public colleges and universities. Now, not all of them. Some of them were, were, were good about volunteering it, but lots and lots of institutions threw the secrecy blanket over their COVID data, claiming, and this is a really serious problem that I hope we can have kind of bigger societal conversations about claiming student privacy. Student privacy or sometimes medical privacy, right? And they say, well, we can't tell you um, how many cases we have because if we tell you how many cases we have, some Sherlock Holmes might be able to reverse engineer that number so that if we tell you that five people have COVID, Sherlock Holmes might show up on campus and figure out, oh, I can, based on that number five, I can deduce that it's Bob and Fred and Sarah, and right? That was their theory anyway, and, and even though you and I and anybody would walk around and say, no, you can't do that, you can't figure out names from numbers like that, that was the excuse that was constantly being given, is we can't give this data, this will compromise privacy if we do. And for, um, for anybody that's um, ever litigated a case against a college or a university or a school, um, um, you will at some point run into what's called the FERPA privacy law, right? law that Congress passed back in the 70s that said that colleges have to maintain the confidentiality of the education records that they maintain about students. And, and when Congress passed this law, they had a very specific purpose in mind. They were really afraid that, because uh, this was the 70s, and lots of schools were starting to send people to school psychologists. Uh, uh, they, they, they couldn't beat them with paddles anymore, so they sent them to school psychologists. <laughs> um, and they would send them to school psychologists, and the school psychologists would do a write-up and put it in their file. And, and Congress was really worried about that, that, well, wait a second, you know, so suppose somebody gets a bad write-up from the school shrink, and it turns out that it is held against them, you know, when they want to join the military, or go to grad school, or get a job. Um, we want those to be kept confidential, and we also want to give parents the absolute right to inspect them. And that's what Purple was supposed to be about. But over the years, it's kind of metastasized into this generalized authority for colleges and universities and K-12 schools to just withhold any document or data that they want to that they find embarrassing or inconvenient. And I will say I've even seen um, um, the uh, scores of high school swim meet withheld from parents on the grounds that we can't get those guys, that's got student names in them. And people can you know, trace the, the score back to a name and so we can't have kids get the scores. I think my favorite example of that took place at my own campus at Florida. I get to tell stories on them now that I don't get a paycheck from them. Well. And at Florida a few years ago, the, uh, the student newspaper there is really impressive, the alligator. They're very, very uh, enterprising, and they make good use of those Florida sunshine laws. And uh, there was a, a, a hazing scandal on campus. And uh, one of the things that um, 
um, that the fraternity was making people do as part of the, the hazing ritual was um, you had to carry a uh, watermelon around a baby bonnet and pretend it was your baby. Uh, and, and that was part of the humiliation that they would give you to uh, uh, as your initiation ritual. And um, the um, um, university investigated this and did impose some disciplinary consequences on the people uh, committing the, the, the hazing. Um, and uh, when they were asked for the records of this, right, because of course people were curious, like, well, you know, did you punish this hazing in an adequate manner? Did you give a slap on the wrist, right? I want to see the, the disciplinary consequences. The university gave back a, uh, a Swiss cheese of a public record that was uh, more redaction than record, uh, where they blanked out all of the key terms in the uh, record, um, all the names of all the individuals, all the punishments that they got, and also, also, the name they gave the woman. The name they gave the watermelon was blanked down on the grounds of student privacy. <laughs> and so you can see, right, that this law, which is very well intentioned, it does some well intentioned things, has been manipulated over the years to be a generalized kind of get out of transparency free card, and it really desperately needs to be reformed. Um, the, um, I feel like openness and transparency in government ought to be the easiest sell in the world. When, when I was running the Breckner Center for Freedom of Information, I used to commiserate with other people in the open government field, like, we suck at our jobs. I mean, this, this should be the easiest sell in the world. How is open government not, how are people not throwing open government parades, right? Because we all, all value and appreciate and love transparency, right? I mean, if you ask that question, you pull that question, Government transparency, good thing or bad thing, off the charts, right? Off the charts. Everybody would agree that it's, it's, it's important. We're seeing this now. This is Senator Capito from uh, West Virginia. Just the other day, put this statement out after uh, uh, people in the uh, Ohio Valley, right, were concerned about Norfolk Southern having a train that derailed with some chemicals that may or may not be dangerous to health in them. Um, and uh, during a hearing, Senator Capito says, you know, the, the public needs transparency. They need to know, you know what chemicals and what quantity and how hazardous and uh, you know, are these going to stay in our water? Are they going to uh, contaminate our agriculture? Uh, uh, why didn't the EPA just let it all hang out, right? Why did they keep secrets? Uh, this isn't from, uh, uh, from, from uh, Norfolk Southern. This is from Flint, Michigan, uh, right? But we all know the story of Flint, Michigan, where people were for many years drinking unsafe, lead-contaminated drinking water, in part because, why? The government wasn't transparent and didn't level with them. So we know, right, that like transparency in government and lack of transparency has real, real costs to our health and to our safety. And it should be a really easy sell. Um, it should be a really easy sell, but understandably, right, it's kind of wonky. It's kind of a process thing, right? People are very interested in, and I am too, in the, in the end product of the transparency, right? They're interested in, I want to know, I want to see those police body cam videos so I know, did somebody get beaten undeservedly or not, right? I want to see those tests that the EPA ran on the groundwater to see if the contaminants are leaking into people's wells or not. I want to see the results, and people are very invested in the results, but not that much in the process. But if you are a person who is invested in police reform, in the environment, in public health, then you are an open government advocate. You just don't know it yet. You just don't know it yet. Um, why should this be an easy sell to the people in the government? It should be an easy sell to the people in the government because frankly, they gotta do something. I mean, trust in all institutions in America is going through the floor. We are at this point where things are kind of coming unglued and people don't trust anything anymore. I mean, forget about, you know, Congress has always been down there and the, you know, they, they barely cracked double digits. The Congress has been down there for a long time, but people don't even trust the courts. They don't trust their doctors, banks, public schools. They don't trust anything anymore, right? You only get up to, you know, and by the way, this, 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 um, this poll is about uh, three years old now, and so who knows what police would register at today, uh, 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 whether they crack 50% or not. But uh, outside of the military, there's very few institutions left in America that command any substantial amount of public trust. And I'm sorry to say, television news is down there. Thank, thank you, Congress, for propping up the curve for us. Uh, but uh, television news is right down there uh, in the doldrums as well. And you know, this, this trust, this distrust by these institutions, by 
the courts, by banks, medical systems, schools, Congress. Right? This has been hard earned. This distrust has been hard earned, right? They've really worked really hard to earn our, our distrust. And so my, my one message in concluding would be, you know, this is not a novel insight. It's something that my, uh, my high school geometry teacher taught me, which is you do not get full credit if you do not show your work. You do not get full credit if you do not show your work. And if we want to turn this around, we want to turn this crisis of distrust in institutions around, it's got to start with honoring the obligation to level with the public. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to turn off. Unfortunately, I don't think that all works. Um, Well, we want to have Q&A now, uh, and we really want people to be able to speak into the microphone. Do you think you're going to try? Right, you might be able to figure it out, so we, you can stay there. But I want the microphone to go out to the audience like uh, uh, Maury Povich or any of those shows. You know, I can actually use this one. Okay, all right, good. All right, David Carter, we're going to be our mic now. Hello, uh, KJ Walter, I'm a political science major. Uh, my question is, do you foresee a future where private social media companies that act as public forums are compelled to uphold the First Amendment on their platforms? Oh, what a great and timely question. What a great and timely question. Thank you, right? Because remember we said that in order for anybody to be bound by the First Amendment, it's gotta be a state act, right? It's gotta be government agents uh, receiving money from taxpayers, right, uh, answerable to elected officials, and of course Facebook and Twitter and YouTube are none of these things. Um, and so they have successfully fought off for years now, right, as long as the platform's been around, people have been aggrieved by their account being closed, right? I got kicked off of Facebook, I got kicked off of YouTube, I got kicked off of Twitter, and that's often what they argue, right, is, well, look, I've been um, kicked out of this, um, this forum that is a forum for the exchange of speech and ideas, and this feels a lot like the like to me that it's as powerful as the government and that the Supreme Court, the case called the Packingham case, even used this phrase that the social media is the contemporary town square. They called it a town square. And um, lots and lots of lawyers have seized upon that language to try to argue that, well, look, you know, even the Supreme Court says it's a town square. Why shouldn't Twitter and YouTube be governed by the First Amendment? And I think that it is just going to be too high of a hurdle to get over, um, um, I mean, there's a lot of institutions, for example, right, private universities and private schools take lots of government money, lots and lots of government money, but you still cannot get your hooks into them under the First Amendment, that's been tried many times, and so even just doing, right, I mean, a, a, a private school in a lot of ways to me is an easier argument than Facebook or YouTube because they're doing something that's very much kind of a governmental function, right, offering education, and they're doing it oftentimes with the majority of their money coming from the taxpayers, and no one has ever won one of those First Amendment cases trying to argue that a private school is answerable to the First Amendment. So I think, you know, a company like Google or Facebook, which doesn't take taxpayer money, I think that's just too high of a hurdle to get over. I mean, there are people who will argue, and it's a much more complicated and long discussion, that like, well, maybe the FCC, right, the people that, uh, that, that set the standards for television, well, maybe they should declare social media to be a utility. And if it becomes a utility, like, like telephones, then the FCC would have some ability to uh, regulate them, including um, um, uh, like they do with the over-the-air television broadcasting, right? Or like regulate their, uh, their content. Um, that, too, will be a very high hurdle to get over. I mean, those companies are very politically influential. You know, one of the, um, so there, there are two, I mentioned that there are two cases called net choice cases that will probably be in front of the U.S. Supreme the next term, one out of Florida, one out of Texas, brought by the same company, um, challenging state laws that try to dictate the, uh, the terms that platforms can enforce. Things like, you know, don't pull down speech by candidates, don't pull down political speech, don't kick people off without giving them an explanation for why, and here's the process that you have to go through. 
And the uh, social media platform companies, understandably, are very aggrieved by this, by this, what they can't think of as an intrusion into their First Amendment rights, right? It, it's really interesting that uh, the First Amendment might be kind of inverted in this equation. Um, there's an old case um, out of Florida called the, uh, the Tornillo case that the Supreme Court decided involving back when people used to read paper newspapers, involving the Miami Herald newspaper. And uh, at the time, uh, the Miami Herald, the uh, uh, Tornillo, who was an uh, uh, unsuccessful political candidate, tried to compel the Miami Herald, basically use the courts to compel the Miami Herald to carry a, uh, a column that he wanted to run, kind of like an equal time argument, right? I want to defend myself, and I insist on access to your pages so that I can defend myself. And the Supreme Court said, nah, 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 this is a piece of private property. And you don't get to use the First Amendment to kind of command that, uh, that publisher to carry your speech because the publisher has First Amendment rights not to be associated with speech they don't agree with. So I think that Tornillo um, barricade would be uh, uh, quite, quite, uh, quite difficult to surmount. If I were to First Amendment. This one, back to the press. Wait for the mic. With all this going on with uh, the state of Florida and dictating what is going on within their schools and what their teachers are allowed to say in terms of the don't say gay bill that they passed, how does First Amendment speech apply to that? I understand that like, you know, we just talked about how schools are government property and government does not have the right to restrict speech, but we've got a, they've, they've got a law that says they can restrict what their teachers and subsequently, I think, their students as well in certain aspects can say. Yeah, oh, again, great question. Man, what a sophisticated audience here. <laughs> um, so interestingly enough, right, the First Amendment most forcefully protects your ability to speak as a citizen. So when the workday is over and you go home and you want to give an interview to a television station or write a letter to the newspaper or go on a blog, First Amendment forcefully protects your ability to do that. But during nine to five, when you're taking the paycheck, the protection diminishes quite a bit. And um, teachers have, have found to their unpleasant surprise that they don't really have a First Amendment right at the K-12 level to make curricular choices. That, say the courts, belongs to the school district ultimately. They are the captain of the curricular ship. And so if the school district says, by golly, you will teach out of this book or you will not teach out of that book, you are supposed to say, aye, aye, captain, uh, uh, and, uh, and obey. And you don't have the ability to kind of substitute your own professional judgment and fall back on the First Amendment. Now, interestingly, in higher ed, you might higher ed, you might actually have a, a First Amendment right. There are a couple of courts around the country, one in North Carolina, one in Washington State, not yet here in, in Georgia, that have come out and said that, you know, we think that the K through 12 level of First Amendment protection is not adequate in higher ed because of this notion of academic freedom. The idea that, well, you know, at the college level, maybe the professor is the captain of the ship. Maybe the professor gets to decide which are the right books and which are not the right books or what to put on the syllabus. And so that hasn't been, but it will be tested, actually. There's a case in uh, Florida is the uh, law that gets all of the attention, but there is one in uh, Oklahoma that was actually a little earlier and will be uh, a little, I think, sooner to be challenged in the, in the court. Oklahoma City. <laughs> um, but I think it will be a little sooner um, to get all the way up through the courts. And so that will probably be the test case because it has both K through 12 and higher ed bundled up in it. Yeah. Um, hi. I'm wondering uh, college campuses have a number of areas for free speech. Uh -huh. uh, for example, sidewalks that are used for messaging, bulletin boards where people can post things. Um, and also the question of like getting permits to have a free speech zone. Do you have any comments on any of those three areas for free speech on a college campus? Ooh, I, you know, this is like the honor side here, man. This is awesome. <laughs> um, not only do I have comments, uh, uh, I can actually point you to. So uh, in, uh, in in 2022, Governor Kemp signed a law in Georgia that actually declares that the entire open space of a college campus, all the area that you or I would be free to go walk our dog on or throw a frisbee on, 
is now what is called a public forum, meaning that you cannot say, if you would like to speak or if you would like to hand out the literature, go over here to this designated free speech zone and not on the sidewalk outside the library or not outside the student union. And so the answer is if you're free to walk the dog there, you're free to speak or hand out literature. Now what the government can do, even after laws like that, these are sort of the it's literally everywhere very soon. It's a, a growing thing is to kind of clarify what the courts had already been saying. Basically, I mean, colleges and the advocates and the legislature got tired of these suits and they were losing every time when people challenged these free speech zones. They just decided, you know what, heck with it. Let's just sweep them away by legislation. And that's what states have been doing. What they can do still is they can uh, restrict them like the size of gathering. Right? So like, you're welcome to hand out literature, and your friend is welcome to hand out literature. But if you're going to be 50 friends, that they can say, you know what, you actually need a permit for that because you're going to be blocking all the sidewalks at that point. You know, we can't, you know, we can't have people bringing dozens and dozens and dozens of people to obstruct you know, foot traffic or you know, uh, uh, cause disorder. So that they can do. That's still legal. Um, and you mentioned like bulletin boards. So interestingly, so I actually have, a, 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 I get to preview this, I have an article that will be published soon in the uh, Vermont Law Review that's all about whether there is a First Amendment right to write on the sidewalk with chalk or not. Um, this is the kind of thing that professors get paid to think about. Um, and uh, I missed that. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the answer is maybe. Um, the answer is maybe uh, uh, that, that, that the, our, uh, our conclusion, I worked on this with a colleague of mine, our conclusion was that because most colleges, like most cities and counties, encourage chalking in some occasions, right? They'll say, like, hey, we're gonna have a chalking competition here, the most artistic dog drawing wins, or uh, let's all show our school spirit by chalking, because they encourage it when it's something that, that message that they support, that they would have a really hard time punishing somebody who like went to the same sidewalk the next day and said, you know, in rape culture and chalk. That would be a very hard thing because that's viewpoint based, right, at that point, um, to say, well, we're gonna find with the uh, Go Jaguars uh, uh, chalking, but not the in rape, rape culture chalking. Um, and so um, um, we think that, that, that there's, a, there's a route there, but unlike the free speech zones, I can't point you to a state law that's right on the nose, but for the free speech zone, that is all right on the nose. You mentioned that um, the idea of like government employees, you know, and how they can sometimes be under an area where it's it's harder for them to have freedom to say what they want. And I'm an active duty military member, spouse. Oh yeah. So my husband often will come home and be like, Hey, you know, I know that we feel this way, but like as an active duty soldier, I can't have this feeling about X, Y, and Z. And maybe even though I know we do at home, like let's not be so sloppy, but that's not easy for me. I'm more like an outspoken, you know, very person. And so are there situations or cases that like maybe you and I could research together where like there are issues within those realms of like where family protection is on like on a civilian. Sure. Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. I mean, I will say that, you know, now I want to go back and put my professor hat on and do some more research on this because the, the military spouse issue is not one that I've ever actually researched. I can tell you that even though you do surrender an awful lot of your freedoms when you join the military, like when you join the police force, right? The courts have never said that it goes down to zero. They've never said that you surrender all of your constitutional rights. Now, there's lots of things that the military could do to an active duty person that they couldn't do to you or not, right? I mean, like the dress code, right? So if somebody were to say, well, you know, I want to wear a uh, AIDS awareness ribbon on my uniform, right? They probably don't have a First Amendment right to do that because that deviates from the uniform standard, right? As long as they apply it in, a, uh, in an even-handed way. But, you know, even in the military, by the way, even in prisons, even in maximum security prisons, the First Amendment doesn't stop applying. And there are prison, prison inmates, a lot of them, that have won First Amendment arguments. Uh, uh, you get to have some access to books. Not every book you could possibly want, but some access to books. Um, you get to, uh, uh, if you have a, a, a deeply held religious belief that requires you to have facial hair, um, the prison can't make you cut it off. Um, and so there are some First Amendment lines, particularly as it regards religious speech, that even the military can't cross, right? Somebody wants to wear their uh, yarmulke on Saturday to go to a, a synagogue, right? They can't say, you're out of uniform, you're, you're, you're punished for that, right? But um, 
Oh, the military spouse one fascinates me. I, 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 we should, I'll give you a card afterward. I want to do some homework on that one. Because <laughs> you're right, right? I mean, you didn't sign any piece of paper that said I'm enlisting. Um, um, so I, you know, I suspect that the answer would be that um, because the military is cautious about kind of divisive political viewpoints that might cause unrest within the ranks, right? That's normally what they'll fall back on is, look, you know, you can't be stirring up trouble to cause people to not have your back in the foxhole, right? And that, so if you put the yard sign out in front of the yard, that might be attributed to your husband. If you put the bumper sticker on the car, that might be attributed to your husband. So like under that factual scenario, you probably lose. But, you know, again, I think there are, you know, again, you can sign these things. So I think there are lines that, that they couldn't cross, but, but I would have to do some more homework to figure out where those lines are. That's a good one. All right, looks like that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate the audience participation. <laughs> including the first amendment rights of our youngsters over here. So thanks, John. Well, the last thing I want to do before we wrap up and let people go off into the night is we, with this um, celebration and discussion of the five freedoms in the First Amendment, we give awards called Champion of the First Amendment. So the first one I want to give tonight is to Frank for coming here from Atlanta, driving over, spending the night, and this is his award for coming over tonight. So much. Thank you so much. I also want to give one each to Dean Davies. So Kim, will you come up? This is the best thing you can do to give your boss an award. But I will say this, um, maybe I should let you talk. But I think as uh, a chairman of a department that she oversees, I can say without hesitation, she is a full-fledged supporter of the First Amendment. And some of the things that Frank was talking about don't apply to her. She lets us say whatever we want to say. That's right, she talks to sidewalks more than anybody. Anyway, congratulations, and thank you so much. Brad, come on up. And a Humanities Dean can only maybe be outdone by a library team. Uh, I think when he talks about free flow of information, these guys, including David Curtis over here, they're the most important people on campus, especially for somebody like me who's a historian. So Brad, thank you so much. Brad Warren, <laughs> Dean of the I want to give one more to a student. And this student, she is here, isn't she? Yeah, she's here. This student, it exemplifies all the things that the First Amendment are about. Especially, I think, if you push it to its borders, the fearlessness you have to have. Maybe even the optimism, the naivety, maybe. Uh, and I want to give this to Rakaya Lennon, who is the editor-in-chief of the Bell Ringer. Come on down, Rakaya. It might be better to say that she is a warrior for the first two minutes, not an ambassador. Congratulations. <laughs> By the way, there's still plenty of cookies, plenty of iced tea, I think coffee, and of course books over here. David, I'm going to have to get the Nat Hedhoff. Nat Hedhoff was one of my heroes, generalistic heroes. Um, Thank you for coming out tonight, drive home safely. I do want to mention a few people are really important. First of all, in the back, Alyssa Jones and Danielle Cosgrove, raise your hands, please. They were responsible for putting this together tonight. It was just my idea, along with Frank's. And then second of all, Morgan Hayes, who's taking pictures. Morgan, raise your head. And she is the PR person for our college. I also want to mention Tim Williams, who I think is out in the hallway. Tim is the head of our TVC lab, our TV cinema lab. He also is the, uh, the advisor of the Media Production Club. These camera people, Rihanna Law over here is the main person, uh, are shooting this for GPD tonight, and then they're gonna come back in the morning, and uh, Rakai is gonna interview Frank a little more for that. Uh, we really appreciate that. And in the back, 
the engineer supreme, the Nashville man, Ethan Balducci, who is our audio engineer. Uh, this will also be uh, audio for GDV. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, we really appreciate Frank coming over. We appreciate the support of our two deans. Thank you so much for coming out. We have a few minutes before we're leaving. If you want to come up, come up and ask Frank a face-to-face uh, -face question. The best thing about this is we got to do it. Three years of not doing it was not really the, the best thing for us. I also want to thank a couple of other things, uh, other organizations, the Augusta Press, the new newspaper in town, it's online only uh, for supporting us tonight. Also the Society of Professional Journalists here at Augusta University, uh, the Bell Ringer and the Phoenix and the Media Production Club and JAG News. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Dean Davies. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, David. We appreciate it. All right, have a great evening. And uh, unfortunately, we can't go see a ball game now. But I will say what the president always says, go Jags. Thank you.